Now, the gap between poor failing states and rich successful countries is as wide as ever. But it's never been easier for those from the poor places to make their way to the rich, which they're doing in huge numbers, even when it's risky, and to very differing receptions. Mrs. Merkel's Germany welcomed over one million in one year with open arms, but quickly realized this was a one-off generous gesture which couldn't be repeated without fatal political cost. Progressive Sweden opened its borders too, thereby fueling the rise of the hard right for the first time in living memory. Italy's new populist government turned away a boatload of migrants in desperate straits. They found refuge in Spain. But it's not clear if that's a welcome the new socialist government in Madrid can repeat. In America, which once cried out for the huddled masses of the world to join it, President Trump placed the children of illegal migrants in cages until forced to make an uncharacteristic U-turn when even his wife complained about the inhumanity. The Western response to the wave of migrants has ranged from the unsustainably liberal to the depressingly repressive. It's not clear anybody has the answer, but from Brexit to Trump to Germany and Italy, it's changing our politics. Here's David Aronovich with his Take of the Week. Cages for children separated from their parents on America's border. Rescued migrants refuse refuge by Italy. And the country's interior minister promising a register for gypsies. The calculation is simple. Hostility towards immigrants and to unpopular minorities wins votes. It just does. That's why the Trump administration acts tough and talks tougher. And even if the president had to back down this week about separating children from their parents, the psychology of it is clear. This week, Donald Trump tweeted his belief that migration had led to an increase in crime in Germany. In fact, it seems to have gone down. And that, to use his words, illegal migrants infest America. like cockroaches or rats, perhaps. In Italy, the Interior Minister talked this week about purifying Italian streets from migrants. This week, too, Hungary criminalised the very act of giving advice to undocumented migrants. I don't like comparisons with the 30s, but rhetorically, this feels like the 30s. And the people who've had the most practical and the most humane response to these events, people like Angela Merkel of Germany, have been the most vilified. But it didn't have to be this way, and it doesn't have to continue like that. Nearly all migrants can be successfully integrated into Western societies who frankly need their drive and their work ethic if their arrival is planned for rather than always regretted. Instead, we've let the psychology of fear govern us, and today our punitive chickens are coming home to roost. Toughness begets toughness. It doesn't work, and you double down, and you create a jailer's paradise. So, welcome to the world of cages and human vermin. A world created not by mass migration itself, but by the fear of it. And David Aronovich joins us now. Welcome back to the programme. Let me go straight to Michael and then Caroline. Michael, what is your reaction to what David had to say? Well, I find David very disdainful, disdainful of popular opinion. Uh, and I think popular opinion is something that you have to be conscious of. I mean, we all live in democracies. These are the countries that we're talking about. And people are worried about immigration. They're worried about a change in values. They're worried about how they absorb these numbers of people. They're worried about public expenditure. They're worried about their jobs. Uh, and it isn't the fact that uh, the flows have been controlled. It, the flows have not been are very well controlled. There's no country, I think, that where the people can feel satisfied that the that the immigration is under control. I, mean, I, I personally am not very bothered about immigration because I, you know, I'm a well-off middle-class fellow. But I don't feel quite as easy as David does apparently about being disdainful about those people who do worry about it. 
Let me get David to respond to that, then I'll come to okay. you, Caroline. David. Yeah. I'm not disdainful of the people. I'm disdainful of those politicians like Matteo Salvini and Trump who exploit people's fears rather than, if you like, trying to suggest that there might be an alternative way of looking at them. And actually, I'm pretty disdainful of politicians also at the centre who have found it expedient not to tell electorates the truth about the problems that they would have uh, maintaining these absolute controls for uh, migration. And the, and the point I want to put to you, Michael, is this. Just just imagine that for the exactly the same number of migrants that we've actually taken in Europe one way or another, instead of saying, look, we're going to try and, we're going to try and do things because we can't have these, etc. Let's imagine that over the last 25 years what we'd said was, we are going to have, we're in a changing world, we're going to have a significant uh, amount of inward migration. The best thing to do, therefore, is both to plan for it and to control it, partially in the countries of origins and so on, and to create a society in which we can make it work for us. But what we've done all the time is played to the gallery by saying, no, 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 we'll try and limit it, we'll do this, we'll set a cap, etc. Never been able to fulfil it, never done the planning necessary, and thus, I think, reap the whirlwind. But I, I don't agree with that, and it depends what you mean by substantial levels of immigration. I mean, many people believe that we have had substantial levels of immigration. And this has been tried in Germany. There was a very significant amount of immigration, there was a million people in a year, and the German people didn't like it. And I think... You know, whatever you may think about it, if you believe in democracy, you have to accept that every now and again, people will have opinions which are not the opinions of the establishment. And if you ignore what people think, well, then you get Brexit, then you get Trump. Caroline, you're a politician of the centre. What do you say to David? Well, I agree with David about managing migration because actually that reflects what the public think as well. Because certainly in my own constituency and all the polling I've seen is most people in the UK, including from our small towns outside our cities that aren't that diverse and haven't had the waves of migration that the cities have had over hundreds of years, uh, they recognise the benefits of migration, but what they feel is it's not fair and it's not managed and it's not planned. And that's part of the problem. The other point I would say, David, is that um, there clearly are people like Trump, like Farage and others the language they use about migration is completely unhelpful to having a sensible discussion about it. But I'd have to say as well that in my own party for a number of years, we've actually avoided talking about immigration and avoided listening to people's concerns. And too often when people raise concerns, insults are levied at them as if they're just out and out racist. And my perspective on that is that's not really true. There are racists out there, absolutely. But I think the fact that so many people across all parties, all walks of life, have concerns about this, they're entitled to be to heard and have a grown-up debate about it. And that hasn't happened for decades now. Yeah. Uh, as far as I can see, we've been done nothing but listening to this for 10 years, and that's fine. I'm absolutely content to listen to it. But the point that I'm putting to you both is that if we'd taken a different approach, and a different educative approach, uh, and a different planning approach to this and thought ahead 10, 20, 20 years ago, we wouldn't now be saying but to people, we wouldn't now be, you've got yourselves essentially as politicians in a position whereby you've been promising the impossible. No. You can't control the flows in the way that you've been suggesting. Not, not, I'm not saying you personally, well, can, but, in, <laughs> but in general, but certainly let's say but, the Conservative Party but, under but David, David Cameron and so on. And the net result is that people therefore think that what you've got is uncontrolled. We've not planned for the arrival of immigrants that we knew were coming and the consequence... I mean, let's take an example. When all of a sudden the amount of midwifery required in a place which has got yeah. young Polish women in it goes up and we say we couldn't have foreseen it, yes, you could. They were there before you knew well, it was Hold on, happen. the government told us only 14,000 would come from Eastern Europe. Uh, it turned out to be 800,000. I know, if and, Andrew, but If you had based your plans on that, your well, plans well, would I mean, have been this, this and is, you, you have used the word planning, which is always thrown out by people, as if planning is easy to do. How would you have planned for hundreds of thousands of migrants to cross from Turkey into Greece uh, or hundreds of thousands from Libya into that, Italy? That How would the, you do that? That was the most predictable thing of all, Andrew, and this is what is so irritating about this. Back in 2012, I wrote the column in The Times, OK, you didn't read it, fine, I don't care, saying we needed to establish safe havens in Syria because one of the things that was going to happen was that you would get a significant refugee outflow. We got a million and a half, two million people in Turkey. We got one million people in Jordan. Did we really think that they were going to stay there on the borders of Europe with no jobs and no prospects, etc.? But how would once you have it became... for it? 
What you'd have said is, we are going to, unless we do something in Syria, then we're going to have a significant number of these people, and when they begin to come, we'd better have a plan for it. But Angela Merkel was the only leader, well, maybe the Swedes as well, but too late, but too late no to plan, plan for she it. She had no plan. No, she, she didn't. No, she she didn't. made that up as she, she didn't, went but along. At least she took a million and a half refugees, at least a million of whom were already gathering on the, either on the borders of Europe or already in Europe, who otherwise would have been our problem. Michael? I think David, uh, probably, I've, I'm afraid, willfully confuses push and pull. So there's one point, which is that growing and developing and healthy societies need an input of new talent. And, and I go along with that. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm very open to recruiting all sorts of people to our universities and so on. The other th thing is the push. And I just don't think it's open to Western societies to take any numbers that result from any push, whether the push is war or civil war or famine or genocide and or whatever. Haven't. It's just not open to we us to take We're getting to Turkey, numbers. we're getting to Jordan. So we one haven't of, taken that. So one of the things we need to do is to see how we can control some of this. And it's very remarkable that the number of boat people has been reduced to a third over the last two years. Uh, possibly by methods that are quite unsavoury, but one of the great pushes in this was not so much genocide or civil war or whatever. It was criminal activity by people who profited enormously from human misery. And for the moment, because we've negotiated with these people, we've reduced the amount of human misery. Mm. And I hope that in future we might interdict these criminals because <clears throat> we can't just be subject you haven't, to push. You haven't managed it so far. Uh, nobody's well, the numbers gone nobody's down. No, 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 no. You can. You you will get you'll get down uh, downward pressure, and you will reduce it a bit. But you haven't reduced it enough, and nor will you, as long as people want to come. That's why the European Union is now bad. talking about opening processing centres uh, in Africa itself. But yeah. those will only work if a significant number of those migrants know that they will be able to get to Europe legally. Now, you've got to answer the question, are you in favour of doing that? Of doing what? Of processing, opening processing centres under the understanding but, that a significant but, number of those people will get to but, Europe. But, but, I, I, I'm in, I'm in favour of interdicting the criminals, who I think are largely responsible for Oh, yeah, the that, easy answer, Michael, easy answer. Well, get let, me, let but me actually, do you know what, I, I'm, I'm not against, whether it's in Syria or elsewhere, working with agencies to have centres where we can, people are documented, families aren't separated, that actually, to be honest, David, it's not those who can afford to pay the traffickers who only get into Europe. And if we have a situation that is properly managed, then I think we should take our fair share. We had, some years ago, in my own constituency, in a plan way, we we took refugees from Kosovo and actually the community of Doncaster, like many others in the country, actually rose to the challenge because it was planned. But let me just say something about the situation we find within Europe because freedom of movement basically allows anybody <coughs> to come here. So we have an open system for that. But for anybody outside the European Union, we have visa controls and restrictions. And some would, could, you could argue that that freedom of movement has affected uh, the restrictions and the numbers who we could be having coming in with specialist skills because we've got one area that is managed and another area that clearly isn't managed but at all. Let me bring David back to the European rather than the British situation. Sure. The European situation is on a far greater scale in Italy and in Greece and then the fallout into France and into Germany as well. Now you may be right but European people seem to feel that it's out of control and that they cannot control who's coming into their country from outside of Europe. The consequence of that so far is that over 30% of the French voted for a hard right party last year. The main opposition party in Germany is now of the hard right. Left and right wing populists are now forming the government in Italy. Nativist governments run Poland and Hungary. If it gets any worse, they'll the future. The social democratic, Christian democratic mainstream of Europe is being sidelined. That's the political danger. No, I, I, can, I, I completely understand the point about control. My, um, my argument is that we could have acted as if we had control, but the price of that would have been taking great, great significant numbers, no more than we actually took in the end, by the way, but significant numbers, but in a planned and controlled way. When it has appeared to happen in an uncontrolled way, then that's what I think gave us the, uh, a very big problem. The rise I of the, the, Yeah, the I will say just one right. thing about Germany, incidentally. The AFD is only the official opposition because the other two big parties are in coalition. They are not the second party in Germany, and nor will they ever become the second party. Mm. In oh, well, 
Well, we shall see. But you're uh, right. Actually, because the CU CSU in Bavaria is running scared of them, as uh, you know. Uh, that, <coughs> that may well be true, but they still. I, okay. that, but I'm prepared to take a bet on that. But you're certainly right about Italy and some of the other countries in Central Europe. But Hungary's population went down by 0.34% last year. Uh, a lot of these other countries we're talking about actually have falling populations. The fear of migration is being used cynically by right-wing okay. parties there. Uh, and we know <laughs> that that can happen. And maybe okay. we should have had respect for the <laughs> German people of 1933, etc., and their democratic wishes, etc. But we know where they are. All right, led. David, I've got to have to stop you there. Uh, but it's a good debate. Thank you for being with us.